Hello, John Little. It's Mike Metzer calling at exactly quarter till one on Monday. Um, I talked to Chris Lund yesterday. He was wondering if you would uh, possibly be open to the idea of writing a book review of heavy duty for the British flood. Um, he thinks it would help the sales, and uh, he knows that you know more about it than anybody else, so I concurred. You're the, good guy. You're the best guy to do it. Actually, I brought your name up. He wondered who might be able to do it. And I said, well, maybe John Little. He didn't know, else. He didn't know who else to uh, approach about it. And I said, I'd give you a call and find out. Um, if you want to, if you have the time and you're inclined to do so, I suppose you should perhaps get in touch with Chris, let him know. He was quite anxious about it. He uh, didn't do real well with that first ad that he put in the British flight for heavy duty. It apparently wasn't very good. I didn't see it. And again, he thought the uh, book review might help. If you can, fine. If you're busy, you and I both understand. Any event, I hope you're doing well. I'm going to be here most of the afternoon. I've got a uh, light evening this evening. I'll be here till we're left at 5 o'clock. So if you get the opportunity, you want to call, I'll be here. Bye-bye. any better or any worse. Uh, I think that from time to time it would be all right, possibly even beneficial to sacrifice range and handle heavier weights, but not all the time. Mm -hmm. Just because we've been experimenting with myself and another friend in the gym, and we've had absolutely astounding progress on it in terms uh -huh. of strength increases on a per-workout basis. Right. It's almost, uh, well, we're down to training twice a week, and on a per workout basis, we're averaging like 30 to 40 percent per workout, and I don't think it's all uh, neuromuscular efficiency because a lot of the movements I've performed before. Uh, I didn't follow that. You're 30 to 40 percent what? Uh, strength increase. Yeah. Per workout. Yeah. Like we're up to doing on bench, and neither one of us are are power lifters. All we're doing 500 pounds for 30 repetitions. What kind of bench? Uh, I guess we're just a flat bench press in a, in a power rack. So we're extending maybe four inches. You're up to 500 pounds? For 30, yeah. Have you tested yourself on a full range bench press? Yeah, the, well, the transfer, I was never a big bencher, but I was able to, I guess, better my previous best by 50 pounds Yeah. in a month. That's not bad at all. That's not bad transfer. I felt it in the lower part uh -huh. because I wasn't used to training there. But uh, nevertheless, there was a, very, a positive transfer on it got to be real careful with this heavy, high-intensity stuff. I may have mentioned it to you before, but what I'm beginning to see a lot more clearly is just how demanding this stuff is. Mm -hmm. Arthur Jones said years ago that for every slight increase in intensity, there has to be a disproportionate decrease in volume, and he was not joking. This high-intensity stuff places a demand on the body of an order that is phenomenal. If you were to draw a line, John, a horizontal line mm -hmm. from left to right across a page of paper with that line representing zero effort, right, and then off of that line 
graph your your daily effort output. You get up in the morning, you take a shower, you scrub yourself down, you dry yourself, you walk to the car, you climb some steps to go into the building, you push a pencil. The 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 graph representing that kind of, of effort output would barely leave the flat line. It would be a little squiggly sine wave. Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden you go into the gym and you perform a heavy set of partial bench presses or a set of heavy nautilus laterals, whatever. All of a sudden that little squiggly line starts to take off in a vertical, straight vertical line off the paper, out the door, down the street, and around the block. <laughs> now within that, within that space, is how much more biochemical resources are used up. Hmm. See how dramatic that is? Yeah, yeah, very much so. I used to occasionally have, and still do occasionally have, people do a second set, for instance, of Nautilus laterals. Mm-hmm. And I realized that that kind of, a, of an increase is wrong. It's way too much. Rather than have someone do a second set, what they should do is Rather than a full second set, maybe do one rep extra. Whatever, whatever. When you start making increases in volume, you think you're not doing enough, perhaps after right. a period of time. The the increments have to you have to start out very very small, because again the the demands even from that one set are of an enormous magnitude, and I'm beginning to understand much more clearly how precise all this has to be. Science is a precise discipline. Right. And there's no way of accurately measuring all these things. But there there are accurate and precise ways of, of increasing volume and resistance and intensity and all that. What I've come to understand more clearly is something else Jones said, that from the time you start training, you should be able to reach the absolute upper limit dictated by your genetic endowment within two years, and he was right. If you are imposing a sufficiently intense training stress on your musculature, Mm -hmm. and you are neither training too long nor too frequently, then you should be witnessing progress not on not on on an irregular, haphazard, occasional basis, but every single workout. Right. Now, here comes the difficult part for most people. The, the general theory advanced by Jones over 20 years ago, trained hard, trained brief, and infrequent, was valid. Mm-hmm. There is a wide range of variation among individuals I'm seeing with regards to recovery ability and ability to tolerate intense exercise. What, what the individual has to work with is the application. Everybody needs intense contractions to stimulate growth. Right. What the individual has to work with is just how much volume and frequency he can tolerate. I have asked at least a dozen individuals, I'm going to ask you now, sure. over the last couple of weeks, mm-hmm. if they have not always noticed that even after up to a two to three week layoff, they come back and they're stronger. Uh, you know, the truth of the matter is we just, we just, I think we've just plateaued, so we're going to take a week layoff. So I, well, I, I, have, I have noted with all of my clients, I have had clients that were either forced to take layoffs or just took layoffs for whatever reason. Almost all of them expressed an anxiety that, geez, I'm afraid I'm going to lose something. Mm-hmm. I have had people take up to three weeks off, and they almost, in every single case, come back stronger. I asked Dorian Yates the same thing the other week, and he said, you know, Mike, that's true. This is not just a minor point to be glossed over, John. Mm-hmm. I'm beginning to suspect this thing with frequency has a hell of a lot to do with it. So are you suggesting that, or perhaps that in future people could train intensely and then back off for even two to three weeks before training again? Maybe train each body part once every two weeks. Huh. Why not? Progress should not be an unpredictable, irregular phenomenon. If you're training intensely enough to stimulate growth, growth is only stimulated during the workout. Right. If you're working out too long and too frequently, you will short-circuit both the recovery and the growth process. So the higher the intensity, even if your workout is comparatively brief, you can still be doing too much. (laughs) So even three sets could prove too much, then? Three sets could prove too much. I have no doubt this is is the direction this has to go in. This high-intensity stuff 
places a demand on the body that is unfucking real. There is, there obviously is something used up, and there I've seen now that there's more used up than I realized. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the the biochemicals are. I mean, there's I know some of them, but there's a lot probably nobody knows. Right. This high intensity stuff is really quite fascinating. If I had the money, I'd like to fund my own research. Oh, it'd be fun. Well, what do you think? Given partials and the superior overload that a partial, just given the fact that it's a heavier weight, can impose on the musculature, what kind of recovery period do you think you're looking at? Well, I'm not so sure that the uh, the load is that much greater. If you were to measure uh, your work output, mm -hmm. doing partials as against full range, the, the actual workload is not that much greater. You know, force times distance times time. Right. The fact that you're, the range is a lot more limited, the, the work probably comes out to be just about equal. That's why I say I don't think that the, it makes much difference uh, whether you do full range with lesser weight or uh, partials with heavier weights. It pr probably evens out to be the same, although uh, theoretically, according to Jones, full range is much more productive. Yeah, although you know, the truth of the matter is I've never yet, in, in looking, I've seen a study wherein a full range will deliver either uh, better overload or recruit more fibers even than, yeah. uh, than a partial. I, you know, I don't know. I know that the muscles generally in in day-to-day -day, uh, activity don't require an exaggerated point of motion to... Uh, to function, you tend to operate in a pretty minimal range anyway. Yeah, right. And uh, and but uh, you know, 500 pounds on a bench would should, should be provide more of an overload than 150 pounds. Say. Right. But well, I had I had a talk with Dorian about this the other day. We've been staying in closer contact. I got him. I got him real psyched up. Oh, do you? I said. I said, look, Dorian, there has never been a single bodybuilder, including myself, that has ever reached the absolute upper limit dictated by his genetic potential. Why can I say that with absolute certainty? Because in order to do so, you literally have to train fucking perfectly. <laughs> you, you get my point? Yeah. And no one has ever done that, including me, even though I understood the, the general theory advanced by Jones, and it is valid. What I didn't understand when I was training for competition was the practical application. I, I took that thing as an arbitrary prescription and just plugged it in uh, and stayed with it, mm -hmm. not uh, not striving to regulate the volume and frequency over a period of time. I said, "Look, Dorian, why don't you do, you pride yourself on being radical? Why don't you become the first already super advanced bodybuilder to to take a to take the, a Mr. Olympia physique and take it to the absolute zenith?" He started getting really excited. Yeah. Uh, you, you know how these guys are. <laughs> so, Mike, you're right. I am radical. <laughs> All right. You're the right kind of guy. <laughs> I had no doubt when I said that. I knew that would 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 uh, whet his appetite. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know he's. Uh, I mean, it's got to be a nice feather in your cap to uh, to advise the uh, fellow who goes on to win the Olympia in '92. You better believe it. He's he's even more receptive now. Yeah. Well, how could he not be? The, Every uh, time I interview him, I always you know asked him about the uh, going back to that day with you in the gym. He always just you know starts raving about it. Well, you know it's curious because he is kind of a low key guy. Mm -hmm. uh, he never said much about all that, even when he left here that many months ago. Yeah. Uh, I talked to him till I was blue in the face, almost like I'm doing now. <laughs> and but you know he's the kind of guy who doesn't respond much. You don't really know if it's clicking or not. Yeah. Um, then the next thing I hear, the guy wins Mr. Olympia, and he, he's telling all the interviewers that he did take my advice, and he cut back to one set for exercise, and it really did work. Yeah. So I was delighted. <laughs> I, I honestly did not think that he would win the contest. Really? No, I just didn't think he had the kind of physique. And uh, just some of the political stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Although I didn't take into account perhaps the fact that it was in Europe, and I know how they are over there. Well, he looked. Uh, he looked good. Actually, the truth of the matter is, I thought he looked better two weeks before. They had pictures. Of the, you saw the picture of that lat spread. Well, he just he just sent me uh, about thirty of those from that same um, 
photo session. Mm -hmm. You look better at the bigger body weight. I know. I, I said to him, I said, Dorian, why didn't the hell didn't you compete at 260? Yeah. And he, he confessed. He said that uh, the last two weeks he started losing weight and he couldn't control it. He didn't know what the hell. I guess he got so angry. I've seen other bodybuilders. My brother used to do that. Really? <laughs> he would look great up until the last many days. And for some reason, he couldn't control the, the weight, loss of weight at that point. And he would shrivel up, although Dorian didn't shrivel up. <laughs> no, far from. But he still looked phenomenal. But he just, it, like, look at that loud spread on those shots. I mean, from before, he just, uh, no one could have stood next to him on stage. Oh. Just incredible. And if he can uh, maintain that, which he should, next time around, uh, he should be a repeat champion, I think. Yeah, one more minute. Yeah, I have plenty of time. I, I want to read my... Uh, <coughs> Read. I just finished uh, chapter four, but it's chapter three actually, in which I talk about my advice to Dorian. Oh, great! Let's we'll hear it. Uh, I think one month after the 1992 Mr. Olympia, which according to all reports he won easily, Dorian was back in Gold's gym during a stop on an exhibition tour. Convinced that the abbreviated system had helped him gain more muscle and win the Mr. Olympia, he asked me for further advice on how he could continue with even greater progress for the 1993 Mr. Olympia. My advice to Dorian was delivered in the form of a challenge, and I quote myself. I don't believe, Dorian, that, Dorian, that there has ever been a top bodybuilder that developed to the absolute upper limit allowed by his genetic potential. Why, Dorian? Because none, including myself, had ever fully understood or properly applied the general, the general theory of scientific bodybuilding exercise. If I had made one major mistake years ago while training for competition, it was that despite having been the arch advocate of lesser training, I was still overtraining, i.e. training too long and too frequently. While Arthur Jones contributed enormously to our knowledge with his general theory that exercise must be intense, brief, and infrequent, it is apparent to me now that he wasn't clear on practical application. He had issued what, in essence, was intended as a surefire prescription for everyone at all times. Train the entire body three times a week. What I have come to understand much better over the last two years as a result of training and keeping records on over 200 individuals is just how demanding high intensity training really is. I have come to understand that when an individual is training properly, i.e. training intensely enough to stimulate growth, and is neither training too long nor too frequently to prevent growth, that he should be witnessing progress, if not every single workout, but at least on a very regular basis. The question, Dorian, is how brief and infrequent should exercise be? I understand you pride yourself on being radical. Well, Dorian, be radical. <laughs> break, away, break away entirely from tradition and find out for yourself how little training is really required. Arthur Jones, by the way, John, said years ago that we've been asking the wrong, wrong question all these years. The question should not have been how much exercise do we need, but how little do we require. Yeah, true, very true. Remember that one. Uh, and, and on here, so what if you find yourself, Dorian, spending only 12 to 15 minutes in the gym every five days? To hell with what others have thought or done. More muscle is what you're after. Set a new and higher standard of bodybuilding excellence. Become the first Mr. Olympia to improve dramatically on an already heavily muscled physique. Be the first to reach the upper limit allowed by his genetic potential. That's good. Yeah. And then I finish up saying many bodybuilders sell themselves short, erroneously attributing their lack of progress to a poverty of the requisite genetic traits Instead of to their counterproductive training practices, they give up training entirely. Don't make the same mistake. Don't believe that all training theories have some validity and then waste precious years of your life try frantically trying one after the other. Just as there is and can be only one set of valid principles explaining the physiology of the human body, so there can be and is only one valid theory, i.e. one set of principles of productive bodybuilding exercise. In the next chapter, I will outline a training program that, incorpor that incorporates these principles. And that's the end of that chapter. That's great. I like that. Are you going? Is the, the, the training program going to include like training once every two weeks or once a week? Or? Well, I'm going to. I'm going to. I tell them that I, I can't issue a surefire prescription for everybody. Right. 
uh, the, the general theory, again, advanced by Jones, is valid. The practical application will, will vary because of this great range of variation that exists among individuals with regard to individual tolerance of exercise. I have a 44-year-old client, for instance, John, that understands the theory, but he still wants to work out every day. After talking to him until I was blue in the face and he said, I want to train anyway, I said, okay, I'll take your money. I'll, if you want me to be in the gym with you. Yeah. He trains every day and he still makes progress. On the other hand, I had a, a young kid who's 21. You would think he'd have perhaps a stronger constitution. Mm -hmm. I had him down to three, or uh, at the most, four sets per workout every four fucking days and he was still overtraining. <laughs> you know, just as people vary enormously with regards to height and weight and intelligence and every other genetic trait, I'm beginning to see how widely people vary in regards to recovery ability. Some people just cannot tolerate exercise more than once every several, maybe even ten days. Everybody is so darn hidebound, tradition bound. Gee, you got to work out three times a week. Why? Because we eat three square fucking meals a day. <laughs> Yeah. Serious. Yeah. Everybody is still crunched in by by these superfluous considerations. As Arthur Jones once said about another area of endeavor, rather than continue in the same vein everybody else is doing, take off in a totally fucking different direction. It's a possibility anyway. Yeah, it's not... I think there's something to it. Again, everybody that I've talked to, and and looking back over my own experience of Dorian said that uh, he noticed it too even after up to a two and even three week layoff people come back and are stronger they can do one two three even more reps than they did the last workout that's significant when i see a guy do a make a one rep improvement i'm i'm ecstatic i understand that that represents that there's something in the muscle that wasn't there the last time right that means that the workout that was conducted two weeks ago not only stimulated growth, the growth was produced and maintained even though he performed no activity for two to three weeks. <laughs> That's uh, right. That would certainly indicate, as you said, too, the, uh, the requirement for, for a longer recovery in the growth period for these people. Yeah. And yet the other fellow, like you said, the train could, could do it every day and still make progress. I am continually amazed at people especially people like Samir Banu, mm -hmm. who are willing to go into that gym twice a day, every fucking day of the year, and make zero progress. Yeah. People have lost sight of the whole philosophy of this thing. And by the way, my last chapter is going to be on philosophy, and it's going to be unfucking believable Excellent. A lot of it's going to have to do with, of course, reason and rationale. 99% of the people out there don't make any progress, which, by the way, is... Uh, is is something that Joe Weider should consider. I believe that Joe Weider is hurting the sport in some ways more than he is helping it. Mm -hmm. Joe Weider and all these other magazines continue to, to print this garbage about training two to four hours a day, six days a week. Yeah. Since putting my phone number in the uh, Flex magazine yeah. and even my local advertising, I've had numerous people call me and say that they always wanted to start a bodybuilding program, but they were turned off by it because they had been led to believe by Schwarzenegger and Weider that you got to train two to four hours a day. Yeah, six days a week. Six days a week. Yeah. Joe Weider would have a much stronger following. He would have more career-oriented, professional, intelligent people involved in this, but he's turning them off by continuing to publish this absolute, utter hogwash. People like... Whoever is writes his articles, yeah, I don't even read them anymore. But I get people calling me all the time and telling me they're confused. Joe Weider, by by being willing to to publish anything and everything, is turning people off. My first chapter, by the way, is entitled "Bodybuilders Are Confused." Every guy who calls me is agonizingly bewildered. The magazine prints so much contradictory information; it's turning. It's not just keeping people away who might have otherwise have come. It's also turning away people that are already in the sport. Mm -hmm. 
I would, yeah, I'd agree with that, definitely. It's funny, you know, we uh, we did the reader survey in the new Flex, or why don't we put a, ch- uh, like a checklist, oh, I noticed that. what you read. You know, we'd be pleased to know that uh, your column is like number one or two in almost every response we got that people read first. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I, I'm not surprised because my phone, my I just got a beep there and he hung up. Oh. My, my phone rings every day, all day long. I wish I had never done that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm glad I'm getting a... I, th- this is how I'm keeping my my finger on the pulse beat of what's going on. I know what these guys are thinking. I know what they're lacking. Mm-hmm. And uh, when they read my stuff, they all say, geez, I was getting ready to give up or I'm confused. And when I read your stuff, there's, it's so common sense. Yeah, it's logical. That's right. Well, it's a no greater compliment could they pay you. That's, that's why I'm excited about getting this book done. Oh, I know. I wanted to talk to uh, uh, someone about getting one published too, but they're, they're talking like three thousand bucks a, a run, a print run. That's yeah. just staggering. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my, my my initial printing bill is going to be about eight grand. Holy smokes! I'm, I'm going to do the old heavy duty journal and the nutrition book. Mm-hmm. The, the the initial the initial printing, of course, is the most expensive because they have to do the typesetting and. The laying out, but once you do that first one, John, it gets cheap. Does it? Oh yeah. It's just that first one that's so expensive. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I just looked at that and I said, "Oh my God." So well, crippling. <laughs> talk to talk to Uncle Joe there. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid uh, I don't know Uncle Joe that well to uh, be dipping into his pocket like that. Well, if uh, once I get my mail order going, which hopefully will be in January, and I can help you out a little bit. Well, it's a kind offer, but I'd, oh, sometime when you get time, maybe you'll read it and you'll see whether or not it's print worthy. Get yeah. your opinion well, on it. Well, I just glanced to it. I have no doubt it's print worthy. I mean, even just perusing it, I haven't gone into it in depth. I just, right now, I don't have the, the inclination to read anything else except think about what I'm doing here. I know that feeling. Yeah. Uh, so I have to get to the printer within the next three to four weeks, and uh, I'm going to, I had the first draft of the first four chapters done. I've got three chapters to go, then I want to sit down and do it all over again. <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, that's, that's how it's done. I'm dying to see this when it's finished. It's good. It's definitely better than that first one. Yeah, and the first one was great. I liked that. Well, look, I've been bending your ear here for quite a while. Hey, no problem. Um, I'll stay in touch, and again, if, if you feel inclined, you have the time, I'll, I'll talk to Jerry about maybe you checking those photo files. I'd, yeah, I'd be more than happy to do that, Mike. And like I say, once, once I get my mail order established and I get my first hefty printing bill paid off and I start getting some money in uh, and you need some help, you want to get that gone, I'll loan you some money. Well, it's very kind. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. No but problem. I'll, uh, I was going to say, I might, I'll be coming down to uh, your neck of the woods once once every two weeks, I think, to do some uh, some column type work. So I'd like to, to sort of keep abreast of how your book's coming along and... Uh, and maybe report on uh, taking a workout with you sometime or something. Well, if, if you're going to get your, if you're going to do a book, I'll show you how I set the whole business thing up. Oh, that'd be super. All right, I got to run. Mike, you take care. You too. Good luck with the rest of the writing on that. It sounds great. Yeah, it's going to be good. And uh, and keep up the good work. All right, sir. Okay, buddy. Have a good weekend. Same with you. Bye now.